Okay, so welcome to my channel on Nigeria Economics. If you have not subscribed to the channel, kindly subscribe to the channel, like, comment, and share so we can bring to you more content. Now, in this particular video, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of game theory, the concept of game theory. And that will help us understand why oligopoly firms, why they behave the way they behave, all right? So actually, game theory helps us understand the inside of oligopoly. In other words, why oligopoly firms behave the way they behave. And this is going to be a series of videos. So in this first series, of course, um, on all, um, in all the series, the series will cover introduction to game theory, simultaneous move and one shot games as a type of game. We'll talk about um, repeated game. We'll talk about finally repeated games, sorry, finitely repeated games and then multi-stage games, all right? Now, in this particular first series, I'm going to talk to you on the basis of game theory. Now, for us to understand the concept very well, we need to take this outside the context of economics. Then we will bring it back into the context of economics for us to understand the concept very well. Now, like every game that we play, in every game, there are players, all right? So if you are playing a football game, there are players of the football game. If you are playing rock, paper, scissors as a game, there are players of that game. If you are playing chess as a game, there are players of that game. So in every game, without the players, we can't play the game, all right? Actually, the players are those who play the game. So without the players, there will be no game. Now, bringing it in the context of economics, specifically bringing it in the context of firms in an oligopoly industry, the players of the firm are the managers that are in charge of key strategic decisions. When I talk about key strategic decisions, what I'm talking about is um, decisions that affect the outcome of the firm. So we have decisions that could affect the outcome of profit. We have decisions that could affect the outcome of market share. We have decisions that could even affect the outcome of your product quality. All right. So managers that are in charge of key decisions that influences key outcomes of the firm, we are those that um, those are the people we refer to as the players. Now, every player have a planned decision that he wants to embark on. Okay. So, for instance, if managers plan to increase price, okay, the strategy is the increment of price. So any plan decision that the managers plan to embark on is called strategy. So if managers plan to increase advertisement, they are called, or the plan to increase advertisement is called a strategy. Now, anytime managers implement a strategy, there are outcomes of the strategy. For instance, if you if, if, if price increase is your strategy, it can bring an outcome like increment in profit, okay? If price decrease is your strategy, it can also elicit a certain outcome, okay? If advertisement is your strategy, it can elicit an outcome like increase in market share. So any outcome of our strategy is called payoff. So payoff are the benefit or the losses resulting from our strategies. Now, like every kind of game, the rules of the game can affect the nature of the strategies that you put in the game. For instance, if a game is played once, it is very likely that you'll be very careful about the strategy that you are implementing. If a game can be played several times, then you could use some of the times as try and error, okay? as trial and error. So here, what I want you to know is that the rules of the game can affect the nature of strategies that will be designed by managers. Now, 
What are the rules or the characteristics of the game? Number one, the order of play is important. So there are some games where the players implement the strategy at the same time, or they implement it simultaneously. An example is rock, paper, scissors game. Rock, paper, scissors game. Now in this game, if two people are playing this game, they will shoot their shot at the same time. So for instance, in that game, it is often believed that the rock covers the paper. The paper is being cut by um, the scissors. And then, sorry, in this game, um, what we see is that the paper covers the rock, OK? The rock can break the scissors. And then the scissors can cut the paper. OK, so here. Let's say two players are playing this game and they tell themselves at a count of three, shoot your shot. So here, at the count of three, if somebody brings scissors and somebody brings paper, what it means is that the one who brings the scissors has won because scissors can cut paper. Now, one of the things I want you to know is that when we are playing a simultaneous move game, like all of us are implementing our strategies at the same time, what will happen is that nobody knows what the other person will play. So for instance, in the rock, paper, scissors game that I'm talking about now, none of the players know what the other player will play. But then if I'm bringing scissors, what it means is that I'm assuming that the other person will bring paper, OK? If I'm bringing paper, I'm assuming that the other person will bring rock so that I will win. So in such a game, each player makes decisions without the knowledge of the other person's decisions, but he makes assumptions about it, OK? Another thing we must notice in the order of play is that there are some games where the players don't implement their strategies at the same time, but one implements his strategy, the other observes the strategy and also implements his. So that game is referred to as sequential move game. So in a sequential move game, one player observes the move by its rival and also selects a strategy based on the strategy of his rival. An example in terms of a um, normal game we play is the game of chess. So in a game of chess, one player makes a move and the other player studies the move and the other player also makes his move, all right? So in terms of order of play, we have simultaneous move game and then we have sequential move game. Now, another characteristic or another rule of a game is that there are some games that are played once. Okay, there are some games that are played once. Once you play, that's all. But there are some games that is played more than once. And even, I mean, we can play it 20 times, 30 times, or even infinite number of times. So a game that we can play it more than once, it is referred to as repeated game. And a game that is played once is referred to as one shot game. Now, putting all these together, it means that we can have four types of games. We can have a game where the players shoot their strategies at the same time or simultaneously, and that game is also played just once, okay? So that one is called one shot simultaneous game. Then also we can have a game where one player makes his move, the other player studies and also make his move, but that game is also played just once. So the, the leader moves once, the follower moves once, and that is all. That one also is referred to as the one-shot sequential game. And then we can have a game where we are playing it simultaneously, but that game is repeated, it's repeated. So, uh, for, so that, that one will lead us to the repeated simultaneous game. That game, the players shoot their shot instantaneously, but they play it another time and they can even play it for so many times. Then also we have a sequential game 
that can be repeated. Okay, now let's start with one shot simultaneous game. Obviously, this is a type of game in which each player makes decisions without the knowledge of other players' decisions, but makes assumptions about it. So this statement makes it simultaneous. And the game is also played one. So this now makes it one short simultaneous game. Now, every simultaneous game, whether one shot or repeated, whenever we represent a, a summary of a simultaneous game in a table or a diagram, it is called a normal form game, a normal form game. So a normal form game is simply a summary of a simultaneous move game in a table, all right? So a normal form game, we are supposed to see the number of players, okay? Secondly, we are supposed to see the strategy of each player. Then thirdly, we will see the payoff of each player in that table. So let's look at an example of a one-shot simultaneous game that has been represented in a normal form. So there is an, an example. So in this example, we have player one here. We have player two here, okay? These elements are the strategy of player two. So capital A, B, C. They are the strategies of player two. Then capital, uh, so, sorry, um, in small letters, A, B, C is the strategy of player one. Now that means that to check the activity of player two or to check the strategy, the, 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 the repercussions of the strategy of player two, we go vertical like this, like vertical like this. And yes. And also to check the implications of the strategy of player one, we go horizontal like this. Now, this means that if player one plays A and player two plays A, the A and A will meet here. And always the payoff for the one on the left, which is player one, is the one on the left in the cell. Okay. So player one, if player one plays A, player two plays A, player one will get 12, player two will get 11. If player one plays A and player two plays B, so we have A, B, so this will be the outcome. So player one will get 11 and player two will get 12. If player one plays B here, but player two plays C, this will be the outcome. So all of them will get 12, 12. So we need to understand this table very well. Now, because it's a one-shot simultaneous move game, okay, player one and player two, they would not know what each other will play, all right? So player one will not know what player two will play. Player two will not know what player one will play. So every manager in an oligopoly firm, when you are confronted, with a one-shot simultaneous move game, you need to do these what-if analysis. So every manager should be able to draw this table on his own, right, and do further analysis. Because you don't know what the other person will play, so you have to do what-if analysis. So you do what-if analysis and say, if I play A and he plays A, this is what will happen. If I play A and he plays B, I'll get 11, he'll get 12. If I play A and he plays C, I'll get 14, he'll get 13, all right? So every manager should be able to do all these what-if analysis before he makes a decision. So let's do some what-if analysis after. Let's assume we are managers and we have drawn this normal form and we are going to do what-if analysis. Now, remember that for a simultaneous move game, each player does not have actual knowledge okay, about what the other person will play, but he will just make assumptions of what the other player will play. Now, let's suppose you are player one. Now, if you are player one, okay, and you think that player two will play A, okay, what will be your best response? So here, what it means is that if I'm player one and I think player two will play A, 
It means that the outcomes will fall in this column because I'm assuming player two will play A. So the outcomes will fall in this column. Now, given that player two plays A, my best response is that I should also play A because 12 is better than 11 and is better than 10, okay? So my best response is that I should also play A because when I play A, given that player two will play A, I'll get 12 and that 12 is better than 11 and is better than 10. And here, one of the things you must recognize is that firms are self-interested. So whenever you are doing this analysis, don't really think about the payoff of your rival. Think about maximizing your own payoff, all right? So the best response, as I've noticed, uh, as I've um, explained earlier, is that if I assume that player two will play A, my best response as player one is also to play A. Now let's assume that player two will play B. So if player two will play B, the outcomes are on this column because he's playing B. Now, if player two plays B, the best outcome for me to get as player one is also to play A. Because if I play A, I'll get 11. So 11 is better than 10 and it's better than 10, all right? So my best response when player two plays B is to play A. Now let's assume that player two now plays C. So if player two plays C, still my best response is to play A because 14 is better than 12 and is better than 13, all right? Okay, now, this will bring us to the concept called dominant strategy, dominant strategy. Now, from the analysis we made, it can be observed that for player one, no matter what player two plays, if player one plays A, he's better off. Okay, from the analysis we did, we realized that whether player two plays A, B, or C, player one's best response is to play A, okay? So this brings, in, um, this brings in the concept of a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is a strategy that will give you the highest payoff, no matter what your opponent plays, right? So dominant strategy is the strategy that will give you the highest benefit, regardless of what your opponent will play. So clearly we can see that if player two plays A, B, or C, player one is still better off by playing A, okay? Now, let's check if player two also has a dominant strategy. So to check, let's assume player one plays A. So you stay player one at A. Player two, his best response is to play C. Because in this row, player two, if he plays C, it is better because this 13 is better than 12 and is better than 11. Now, if player one rather plays B, okay, the best response of player two is still to play C because 12 is better than 11 and is better than 10. Now, suppose player one rather plays C. The best response for player two is to play A because 15 is better than 13 and is better than 14. So realize that the best response for player two is C, C, A, and it's not consistent. So this means that player two does not have a dominant strategy. If you have a dominant strategy, no matter what the other person plays, you must be consistent with what you are playing to benefit, all right? So here, player two does not have a dominant strategy. The question therefore we must ask ourselves is that if you don't have a dominant strategy, what do you do? Now, if you don't have a dominant strategy, you must assume that if your rival has a dominant strategy, he will play his dominant strategy. So if you don't have a dominant strategy, you must assume 
that if your rival has a dominant strategy, your rival will play it. Now, once your rival will play his dominant strategy, it means that you must choose something within your rival's dominant strategy and play it that will benefit you. So in simple terms, what I'm saying is that because player one has a dominant strategy A, okay, it means that he will definitely play it. Now you as player two, that you don't have a dominant strategy, you must look for something within this role which will benefit you. Obviously, what will benefit you is to play C because 13 is better than 12 and it's better than 11. So here, the secure strategy for player C is to play, sorry, for player two is to play C, all right? Because once player two does not have a dominant strategy, okay, he is in a worst scenario. But then in that worst scenario, he must pick the best. And the best out of that worst scenario is to go for 13 by playing C. Okay. Now, when the two of them meet, we have what we call Nash equilibrium. So Nash equilibrium is a condition describing a, st a set of strategies in which no player can improve her payoff by changing her own strategy, giving the other players strategy, okay? Now, what it means is that whenever we achieve a Nash equilibrium, every player plays what he thinks is the best response to what the other player will play. For instance, player one knows that when he plays A, it is the best for him, or it is the best response to player two. Now, player two also knows that player one will play A as a dominant. So player two, his best response is to play C, all right? So in essence, a Nash equilibrium occurs in a non-cooperative game when each player adopts a strategy that is the best response to what is believed to be, what is believed to be the strategy adopted by the other player, okay? So it means that once everybody shoots what he thinks is the best response to the other person, you end up achieving an equilibrium state and that equilibrium state is called Nash equilibrium. And it's, a, it's an equilibrium because once a player moves from that equilibrium, he will decrease his payoff if he doesn't move with the other person. So at the Nash, as, at the Nash equilibrium, when one player moves alone from the Nash equilibrium, holding the other player, sorry, the other player constant at the Nash equilibrium, the player who moves will reduce his payoff, all right? So that simply means that because Nash equilibrium occurs at what each person thinks is the best response to what the other person will do, it can occur in three ways. Now, if a player has dominant strategy and the other player does not have dominant but has a secure, the one that has dominant knows that his best response or his best reaction to the other person is to play his dominant. And the other one who doesn't have dominant but has a secure strategy, his best response to the one that has dominant is to, is to play his secure strategy. So a Nash equilibrium can occur at, a dominant, at the intersection of a dominant and secure strategy. That is when only one firm has dominant and one has secure. It can also occur at the intersection of dominant and dominant. That is when both firms have a dominant strategy. And it can also occur at a secure, secure strategy when none of the firms have a dominant strategy. Now we can apply one shot games in these scenarios. We can apply it to, the pri to pricing decisions. We can apply it to advertising decisions, uh, uh, sorry, advertising and quality decisions. We can apply it to output decisions and we can apply it in terms of coordination. So this will bring us to the end of um, or part one of the series on game theory. So please do well to subscribe, share, comment, like, and let us have your feedback. But most importantly, do well to subscribe to the channel 
so that we can bring to you more content. So in the next video or part two of the series on game theory, I'll teach on application of one shot simultaneous games to pricing decisions and advertising and quality decisions. So I'll meet you in the next video. Thank you.